Well, thank you. Thank you, David, for the introduction and for the invitation and to all of you for coming. And this is going to be slightly different flavour because we're going to go on a journey together through time and see the some of the consequences of living on a planet that has a remarkably large tide. That is the underpinning thing in all of this, is that we have a tide in our ocean. Now that has affected different parts of, of the Earth system. Uh, and then there will be something about the chicken towards the end. And um, just to, because we can, we'll talk about the fire-breathing Tyrannosaurus rex uh, towards the end as well. But as they say in the... In, and I, before I continue, I need to acknowledge all my collaborators, without whom this work would not have been possible. They're scattered throughout the world, um, from Oxford to America, um, Lisbon and Germany. Um, and as they say, in the opening scene of the Rocky Horror Picture Show, I would like, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. And the strange journey starts here. This is planet Earth. 400, 410 million years ago, you can see the age up there. MA in geology speak means million years ago. Now, I always tell my first year students, never have animations in your presentation. And this is supposed to be an animation that I now decided to stop working. So soon I need to actually leave the presentation and open it in another program and run through it so you can see. But I'll talk about it here first. This comes from Cora Matthews in Oxford. And we're going to see how Earth has changed in million year steps over the past 410 million years. And what you're seeing are the tectonic plates, or the bits of the crust that make up the hard surface of the Earth. And Earth is unique in that it is broken. So it's a bit like a cracked eggshell, and we're the only planet, actually, that have that in the solar system. And you can see the different plates outlined here, and the brown outline shows where the continental crust end, that is crust that is land, the bits we can walk on. And the green contours show where present day land or coastlines are, so we can orient ourselves and we see that 410 million years ago we were up here, very close to Greenland and North America. Um, and the white part of this is ocean, and the sea floor is also crust, but it's very, very different and the blue and purple outlines where the different parts of the seafloor is. And we're going to see that. So this is, to Cara, four years to put this together. This is pretty much her PhD work summarized in a one minute, 14 second animation. <laughs> so, uh, and it's, I think, fantastic. And I'm quite sure this is not going to start. No. So we'll do, this. We'll do it the hard way. <coughs> And hopefully, hey, there we go. So that's the same as the one I just showed, but without my background. And the reason we start at 410 is because this is a time of a major evolutionary event in Earth's history. And we're going to come back to it. But this is when fish started walking on land. That's one reason we're interested in this. Uh, and as we go through it, you're going to see how the continents move and Earth becomes reformed and we approach a huge mass extinction event when lots of different life forms died, about 350. And then as we approach 320, you see that most of the continents are now aggregated together. And we have formed what we call a supercontinent, and this one is called Pangaea. And it's going to sit there for about 130 million years. And at 250, we approach the great dying the largest mass extinction event we've had on the planet, where three quarters of all animals died. And you can see that already the North Atlantic is actually starting to fracture up, and soon the Indian Ocean will open, and the South Atlantic will open. At 180, Pangaea is starting to break up. And this is the age of the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs formed and started showing up at about 220, and slowly you can see it starting to take the shape we're used to seeing. India will soon break the speed limit for tectonic plates and move at 20 centimeters per year at the same time as the dinosaurs became extinct. And then slowly things settle down and we get the picture that we are used to seeing when we, when we look at planet Earth. And slowly it settles down and then it starts over again. So I'm going to leave this now and go back to my presentation instead. Now, we know 
that the tides are very sensitive to the shape and depth and size of the ocean basins for various reasons. Uh, so the question that people like me ask, if, if the Earth has changed this much, if the continents and the oceans have changed that much, what has happened to the tides? What did the tides do and why should we care about what the tides have done? Uh, so uh, an overarching question really is how much have the tides changed during this period, 400 million years, and why do we care about that? And we're going to uh, land at certain interesting time slices and see what the tides were doing and how they have affected uh, other component of Earth. And to, to do that, we kind of need a little bit of a motivation, and this animation does work, which is nice of it. This is what the tide looked like yesterday. It loops through every hour, and it does that for 24 hours. So it's the tide for yesterday, and you can see how it moves around. It moves like a wave when we look at it from space, uh, and it reaches 16 meters in Bay of Fundy and 12 meters in the Bristol Channel here. They're the two largest tidal ranges we have on the planet. And if we have water moving that much and waves moving that, there must be any, an enormous amount of energy in it. And fortunately, we know quite well how much energy is. It's the equivalent of four million Mars bars being pumped into the ocean every second. I accidentally once said in a second year lecture there was four million Mars bars being pumped in and the students were ready to run out and start scooping for them, but I couldn't find them. And that's a copious amount of energy and that has a really significant impact on the system. And a good way of illustrating is that if you take a cup of coffee and dump sugar in it and just leave it, you're going to have a quite sugary, gloopy coffee at the bottom of the cup. And it's going to take a very, very long time before the whole cup becomes sweetened. It will go cold long before that has happened. But if you put a spoon in and give it a stir, it only takes two seconds. And you've taken that sugary mess from the bottom of the cup and brought it up and mixed it and stirred it up throughout the whole cup. And you have an evenly sweetened coffee. And we have the same problem in the ocean that we have things that end up in the deep parts of the ocean that we can't bring back up to the surface. And there are two really important things here. One has to do with the cold water that sinks because it is cold in the polar areas around Antarctica and in the Arctic. It reaches three, 4,000 kilometers down and spreads out at great depths along the purple bands. And then it's replaced by a warm flow in the surface. And this is the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream is part of this circulation. But that deep water down at depth can't come back up to the surface by itself. It's really difficult to move things that way in the ocean. And that's where the tide comes in. The tide is the spoon equivalent in the ocean. The tides stir and mix and ventilate the ocean. You can say that it makes the ocean breathe. It keeps the ocean not being a, a stagnant pond, but something that keeps moving around. And we have the same process acting in shallow waters. So this is a snapshot, that's the southern tip of Ireland, and that's, uh, uh, that's Cornwall. And out in the shallow part of the ocean, the shelf, which is a few hundred meters deep, we have a lot. The red here implies that there is a lot of biology. There's a lot of production. That means we have a lot of fisheries in those areas. And that happens in shallow water because the tide is pumping water up from down below up to the surface. And that water has a lot of nutrients in it, so it supplies and sustains the production close to the surface. And without the tides, we wouldn't have that strong fisheries on the European channel. So there are two reasons here to look at the tides. It ventilates and mixes and makes the ocean breathe uh, at various scales. That's one reason why we care about what, what happened uh, to it in the past. And then there is another spurious effect of having all this energy going in. And I like this picture down here because it shows the Earth and the Moon to scale. So if we, if we could shrink the Earth and the Moon, they would be this distance apart, roughly, which is surprisingly close if you see it that way. And also, just curiosity, you can fit all the other planets in between, just about. If you remove the rings on Saturn, they actually just all fit in between. it. But because we have all that energy being lost, the Earth's spin is slowly slowing down. So days are getting longer, 200 seconds per million years. There's not something that we need to worry about every day. But if you go back 400 million years to the beginning of the animation, 
you had 21 hours today and 400 days to a year because of the tide. But there's a spurious effect of that, but because the Earth's rotation is slowing down, the moon moves away. The whole system becomes bigger. And it's the same process as an ice skater who spins. They spin fast when they have their arms close to their body. And if they extend their arms, they slow down. It's the same thing, but backwards. Because the whole system is slowing down in its rotation because of the tide, the, moon must, the whole system must become bigger. So the distance between the Earth of, and Moon is actually set by the history of the times. And the problem is that at the moment, the Moon is moving away way too fast to fit the history of the Moon. We know it because we've been firing laser beams towards the Moon since the Apollo missions. And we know with very high accuracy, with fractions of a millimetre, that is moving away with, by 3.82 centimetres per year. And that's too high to fit the picture. So there's another reason to go back and see what the tides were doing in the past to try and reconcile the age of the moon with how fast it is, it is moving about. And then I need to point out one thing, and I apologize for the quality of this figure. Uh, it was the best I could grab, believe it or not, uh, and it's uh, the spring neat variation in the tide, and it's important when we come to one of our slices later. This is the, this is the prediction for, uh, for Clandidno. So this is today. And then it goes a week forward. And you can see that today we had a very large tidal range here. It was seven, almost seven and a half meters. And a week from now it's going to be three and a half meters. And then it will come back up. And in two weeks from now we will be back to being about seven and a half meters. And this is the fortnightly spring neap variation. And it comes from the Earth and the, uh, the Sun and the Moon working together. During springtime, like today, the Sun and the Moon are aligned. In a week's time, the sun and the moon won't be aligned. They will be pulling in opposite direction. And then you get a smaller tide. And then they align back again, and the tide becomes larger. And this fortnightly variation from high to low to high range is absolutely crucial for one of the uh, time slices we're going to st uh, step down in later. So I wanted to just uh, point that out so we know what we're talking about. And these are the seven slices we're going to start looking at. That was the one where roughly where Kara started her animation. We're going to move back to 690 million years ago. Actually, we're going to go back to 750, but there's really no difference between them. And then we're going to step in a few of these because they are interesting from other events happening in, in Earth's history. Uh, and we're going to use a computer model that is very good at reproducing the tides, but I'm not going to go into any, any details of that. So we can start our journey. Uh, and the first slice is Snowball Earth, that was promised in the title. So between 750 and 600 million years ago, there was another supercontinent called Rodinia that sat and looked pretty much like this in the Southern Hemisphere. And it was also a time when Earth entered a state and looked a bit like this. That is, most of it was covered in huge quantities of ice. And it's not difficult to get Earth into this snowball state. It's a stable climate state. The problem is getting it out. And you need to do something pretty serious to get the system out of a snowball or ice out state. Uh, and it's, these glaciations lasted a really long time, 35, 40 million years. In the past two million years, we've had eight ice ages. They've lasted 100,000 years. This lasted millions of years, each of these. And was sitting there. And there was only a small band close to the equator over the, and over the ocean that wasn't covered in ice. It's also an interesting period. And you need to think a little bit about what Earth was like if you removed the ice or when it became ice-free. Because life only existed as primitive forms in the ocean. There was nothing on land. It looked like this. That's Venus. There's nothing. It's just rock and a bit of gravel because of wind erosion and some, well, it rains sulfuric acid on, on Venus, so it's slightly different in that sense. But there was nothing on land. It was just bare rocks, basically. Uh, and the question is, how do we get out of this state? And there are quite a few different ideas. And we think, and this is, this finished last week, basically, so we're still thinking about this. But we think if you cover it with some form of crudely drawn extent of ice that leaves the ocean in the middle free and the land or land is ice covered, if you have large tides at the, where an ice ends, 
the tides lift and bend and flex that ice and makes it break up. And as soon as ice start to break up, you can get more heat into the ocean and then it gets warmer and then you can melt more ice and you have a positive feedback. That's what's happening in the Arctic at the moment. Because of warming, the Arctic sea ice has started to melt and then you can get more heat into the ocean. The ocean is much better at absorbing sunlight than, than the ice is. And it warms more and you get a positive feedback. And we think that the tide might have triggered or helped starting to break up the ice. And the, it's all about getting the right amount of tides in the right location. And we get large-ish tides along the coastlines, roughly where the geological record suggests that the ice actually ended. So this is one plausible mechanism, together with loads of others, to start helping break the ice up. And there's a lot more work needs to be done by this. And Dave is sitting there, he's going to spend some time on this, even if he hasn't realized it yet, uh, during his PhD. <coughs> So it's about getting the right amount of energy in the right place. And up here, in all the slides, I show a measure of how energetic the tides are. Remember I said there were four million, the energy in four million mass bars being pumped into the ocean every second. That's the green dot. That's present day. And I must say, I've never typed the unit mass bars per second before, but that's the first time for everything. So there are four million of them in present day. And back 60, 600, 700 million years ago, there was... 20% of that. So if you're chocoholic, it was not the time to be around back in those days. So this is one stamp, one intriguing time stamp we're looking at, the snowball earth and the effect of the, and influence of the tides in that. But there's a lot more to do on that. So we'll see in a year or so from now where we've, where we've landed with that stuff. You said that these figures, they will come up, they show, they show the range in meters, so the difference between high and low water, but the scale actually saturates in some of them, uh, just so we can see things later. And then we have the exciting time slice 400 million years ago, when Kara's animation started, when fish started walking on land. And this was a very different environment to the previous one, because plants and insects had established themselves around 50 million years, 40 million years before this. Uh, and you had huge creatures, the fish that were this size, swimming around in shallow water in coastal lagoons and marshlands. And for some reason they decided that it would be a good idea to get onto land. And that's a really strange thing. And it's a unique event in Earth's history. It's the only time that vertebrates, that is animals with a spine, for removing politicians, uh, actually made the transition from the ocean onto land. There have been several where land-living animals have gone back into the ocean, sea snakes and um, sea lions and seals. They started as land animals that have made a transition back. But this is the only time in Earth's history where vertebrates animals with the spine have gone from the ocean. And why on earth would they do that? Especially when you had this cre creatures like this. This is a scorpion that was about that long roaming around. It's not something I would like to encounter, but they thought it was a good idea. And it happened quickly, within a few million years. And one idea we have, it's not the only reason, but one potential to put pressure on the animals is that if you're swimming around in an environment like this, and the tide goes out, you're stuck in a pool. Well, you'd, you then wait until the tide comes back in half a day later. I just had a fear moment of actually dropping this when I do that. I wouldn't start chucking things at people. But if you have a large spring neap range, remember the fortnightly cycle. If you have a large spring neap range and you're stuck at spring tide, then the tide doesn't come back until weeks later in this case. So if you have law, and after a while you will run out of food, or you become food, and in any case you will swim around in your own excrement, so it's not a very pleasant environment, and perhaps you would prefer 60 centimeter long um, scorpions to doing that. Uh, so the idea is that those fish that had large fins, they could flip themselves back out, or drag themselves back into the ocean. So there's an evolutionary pressure there that those with large fins and limb-like structures, they survived. 
better than those that didn't. And that slowly, within, well, slowly, geologically, is quite quick, in five, six million years, led to the evolution of limbs. And it's very well dated. The earliest proof we have is from 396 million years ago. And it's this creature here, which is about a metre long, and it left footprints in a clay, uh, which is now found in a quarry in Poland. And it were, walked with exactly the same gait as a modern day salamander. 400 million years ago. You can put, put a salamander walking on it and it would be exactly the same pattern of the footprints. And these are so incredibly well preserved that we know that this creature had seven toes. Because you can actually see the imprint of the toes in the footprint. And there is no drag mark, so it really walked with weight-bearing limbs. It didn't just paddle itself forward. So that's another interesting time slice. Well, the question, of course, is well, what were the tides doing? Were the tides large? And they were. Not in a global sense, but they were large in the regions that matter. And the Sahelmi was down here in what, that's Poland, the Baltic states are up here. This is North America, Siberia, Europe around here. And the tides were large in all the regions where we have found early tetrapod fossils. And the same down in parts around here, which of course you recognize as modern day South China, uh, down in regions here, same thing, early records, mainly of development of lungs, same process, stuck in water, if you can breathe air, you survive. So there's a quite exciting result that came out of a master's project in Bangor uh, a couple of years ago, um, where we think that this is one of many potential mechanisms that leading to fish developing limbs and starting to walk on them. And then we move to the exact opposite of an evolution event, and this is the Great Dying, 252 million years ago. This was the most serious mass extinction event in Earth's history. So throughout Earth's history, there have been serious events where a lot of animals have died off, families of animals have died off. This is the most serious one. It killed off a lot of families and a lot of, um, uh, of species. It also opened for the dinosaurs. So the dinosaurs started evolving rapidly after this because there was a niche for them and other creatures had, had died off. And this was a period of, in this dramatic illustration, of chaos, and it was. It was a rapid event with lots of volcanic activity. If you remember from Kara's animation, this was a time where the North Atlantic and other basins actually started to open up. They started to rift and crust started to pull apart, and that means there are volcanoes. So there were, and it was, sea level was very low, and there were a whole range of factors that came together to lead to this dying, and the tides were doing pretty much nothing. So we say, well, the tides weren't doing anything, so they can't have been important, but we argue that's exactly why they were important. Because if you dump a lot of things into the ocean, and the ocean is well stirred and well mixed, or if you have a pond, with a pump in that circulates the water, you're going to have a nice healthy pond. But if you have a pond you just leave standing, it's eventually going to become really murky and the tides weren't there to ventilate it and mix it. So whatever you dumped in the ocean stayed there. It couldn't be taken care of and buffered. There was no capacity for the ocean to handle the stuff. Uh, that was dumped in it, so that led to marine extension, and then you had a lot of other things, a change in climate and environment on land, that led to changes in the, extent, uh, in the extinction on land. So this is an, the peak of Pangaea, the main part of this supercontinent we had, where there is nothing happening with the tides, which we shall see actually becomes quite important. And then we have two other ex extinction events around 100 million years ago, and they're not as dramatic, but they killed off creatures in the ocean, especially invertebrates, the creatures that couldn't move fast enough. Because we had sea level rise and warming, so we washed large amount of material from land into the ocean, into shallow seas that again were very poorly ventilated. So again, you had a stagnant pond. The problem is that the stagnant pond is pretty much this entire area here, which is very shallow. All that was a shallow sea in these days. And we say, well, it's horrible for the animals, of course, that died out, but this is where a lot of our oil and gas and coal reserves come from. They actually come from this sea area here, from these extinction events. Um, and this was a time of huge dinosaur. The, the picture we have of dinosaur with the big ones roaming around, uh, munching on trees and 
and things. It was peak of the dinosaurs. And we know there were large swaths of ocean that didn't have any oxygen left in it. When you dump organic material into the ocean, it starts to break down. That requires oxygen. If you were smelling the water, it would smell of rotten eggs. And we know that because if you look at the actual ge geology, we have bedrock and then we have nice healthy muddy sediments. And on top is this black gunky stuff, which is now a, a rock, a type of slate. And that black rock implies that there was no oxygen around when that formed. And it's in that that we find oil and gas and coal reserves today in the marine environment. So these dyings, they serve a purpose for us as well. We actually use the resources from them. This is another exciting slice where things went wrong because the tides were large, but in the wrong area. There are large tides up in the northern hemisphere, but not in this vast shallow area in the middle where there was a lot of environmental change. And then we have my favorite slice, if you can have such a thing as a favorite time slice. 55 million years ago, with the tides were starting to light up a little bit, and this was a greenhouse world. Sea level was high, it was nice and warm. On present day Svalbard, instead of crazy Russians and Norwegians and polar bears, you had crocodiles and palm trees all the way up here. And it's an exciting period because we are approaching a similar state with climate change if we take things to the extreme in a few hundred years. But there's a problem for the community to, to, to uh, simulate this stage using climate models, the computer models we use to say, well, the future is going to look like this. And a, a good example is that this here, this is the South Pole and that is the North Pole. We have the equator in the middle. This here shows sea surface temperature today is freezing at the poles and 27 degrees in the tropics. 55 million years ago we had this orange curve. It was 36 degrees in the tropics and you had tropical temperatures in the poles, 25, 26, 27 degrees, hence why you had crocodiles rather than polar bears up at the poles. But this changed temperature curve couldn't be simulated in our computer models because they were putting the wrong tides in. They were putting present day tides in, mainly because we couldn't look at what the tides were doing 55 million years ago until about five or six years ago. If we put the real tides in, even though they're weak, whatever we have here in the Pacific is enough to keep that circulation going. The picture I showed earlier with the bright colored ribbons and the Gulf Stream, that could be more energetic when the tide is stirring more and we could keep this reduced temperature difference between the equator and pole because we transported more heat from the equator poles basically and then as the tides changed that collapsed and if we go forward to 25 million years ago we've entered an ice house climate it's not the snowball but this is the climate we are still in now and it became cold because the tides changed a bit and also because australia decided to move north towards the equator and that changed ocean circulation patterns which meant that Antarctica became ice covered 25 million years ago and that went very quickly. It took 200,000 years to build a three kilometer ice cap in Antarctica. That's how rapid this climate change was in terms in geological terms. Otherwise there's not really much going on in it. It's starting to look like Earth but uh, there wasn't a way for the tide to mitigate the climate change that happened. It dropped down and the climate changed uh, because of that. And then we have the proper ice age, 20,000 years ago. And it lit up like a Christmas tree in the Atlantic. It's the most energetic the ocean has ever been in our simulations in this. And it has to do with changes in sea level and the perfect size of the Atlantic Basin to host a very large tide. Uh, and there have been eight of these glaciations lasting about 100,000 years each over the past two million years. So over the past two million years, the tide has gone from being very energetic down to slightly below present and back up again and dropping down. But it's the most energetic sli time slice we have found so far. And this had all sorts of consequences for the Earth system and for the tides. Uh, for example, it's been shown that the large tides up here, there was an ice sheet covering North America and because the tides were all the way up against it, they might actually have helped with that ice breaking up. So they might have shortened the ice age by 5,000 years or so by helping uh, that ice break up. And then we're back today. 
So this is what the tides look like on Earth today. And if we zoom in on this figure up here, we can see that when we had the two supercontinents, this is Pangaea, the one we saw in Kara's animation, and this is Rodinia that was sitting there during snowball, the tides are always very weak in terms of mass bars they are at well, less than a million, uh, definitely less than two million mass bars every second being pumped in. And then in between, the tides become energetic and uh, something happens, and we are at the beginning of one of these peaks now, beginning geologically speaking. So it made me wonder, we know that we're going to go into a new supercontinent in 200, 250 million years. So what will happen with the tides over the next 200 million years? And the problem with that is finding someone who's looking at what the Earth might look like over the next 200 million years. And there is a guy who does it, and he's fortunately in Lisbon, which means that you can go to Lisbon and talk to him about things. Uh, his name is João Duarte, and he's come up with one of four plausible scenarios for how we form the next supercontinent. Uh, and this is another film that isn't working, so I have to leave the presentation and show it to you in another way. But we're going to move from present day to 250 million years into the future, again in million year steps. And I realized when I showed up that there is a writing up here that tells you which year we're looking at, but it does for some reason turn black, which makes it a bit difficult to see on the black background. But it doesn't really I'll point out the, the important events for you uh, when we get that far. So if I do this, and we do that. Here we go. Let me start that again. So we start the present, and it's going to run forward, uh, and you're going to see us forming the new supercontinent, which Rao decided to call Aurica, for reasons uh, that will become a little bit obvious, uh, hopefully, towards the end. So here we go. Australia keeps moving north, and then there is something happening. Siberia splits. What? What the heck? What was Joao thinking when he did that? And then Antarctica moves up, so it's called Aurica because it forms around Australia. And then the other continents come together. We close the Pacific Ocean and slowly we're going to close the Atlantic Ocean as well. Remember at the end of Kara simulation, I pointed, I mentioned that there were a lot of things that happened around, uh, around Asia. And you might remember that there was a lot of small plate fragments coming together where India smashed into the system. That's not the one I want, so let's go back to my presentation again. And there is actually a rift zone in Siberia. It goes from here and all the way up into the Arctic. Because that part around here is just made up, it is like a crushed eggshell, it's made up of lots of different plates. And the whole European Asian plate is actually slowly drifting apart. And that rift is opening. And Giroud decided to say, well, OK, what happens if that actually opens up? And there are some geological reasons for doing that. And that is that we can close both the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans. And it's tempting to do that because they are both really old. Or the Pacific is too old. It shouldn't be that old. And the Atlantic would be very old if we don't do it. There are other ways of forming a supercontinent. It doesn't really make much difference. We're going to have a new supercontinent within the next 200, 250 million years. And the signal that I'm going to show what happens in the tide is actually going to be pretty much the same throughout them. So we did what we did with previously. We have six time slices. And you see 50 million years ago, we had this rift opening. And then we aggregate the continent together. And the tides drop a little bit. 50 million years ago, they large in areas, but weaker in other parts. And then they stay at roughly that level for 150 million years. We say, what are the consequences for the Earth? Other components in this. Your guess is as good as mine, what Earth is going to look like 150 million years from now in terms of life, etc. So this is perhaps an academic exercise, but we draw some important conclusions from it, as I shall show in a little bit. And then when we hit the supercontinent, the tides have dropped back down to these low levels of around a million mass bars per second in energy rather than the four million mass bars. And there are only a few areas where the tides remain large. And then it pretty much looks like the other pictures is just pale blue throughout it. So if we add that to our series, time series, so the one here is four million mass bars and that's two million mass bars. Then we have this picture of no t 
tides during supercontinents and large tides roughly halfway between them. And this is important because there have been several supercontinents on this side of the, of the graph going back billions of years, but we can't simulate them because we don't know well enough what Earth looked like. We don't have all the details. But we can say that during a supercontinent, the tides were weak. So when the continents are together, the tides are weak. As we open up and the continents move around, halfway through that process, the tides become large, and then as the continents reform, the tides drop again. That means we can go back and say we know there was a supercontinent two and a half billion years ago, and there was another one at another state. Halfway between those, the tides were probably large. So there is a reason to go back and look at this. So we're now covering a billion years, which is about 22% of Earth's lifespan, basically. Not as far back as we can go and do these things. So we found this supertidal cycle, Joao decided it was a good name for it, because we have the supercontinent cycle when we go from continents together, they break up, and then we reform the supercontinent. And together with this is this cycle of the tides being low, becoming high, and going low. So we have a supercontinent cycle and an associated supertidal cycle with that, which we were quite excited about finding, actually, when, when it popped out. So have tides changed a lot, I asked at the beginning? Yes, they have. We have identified this cycle, and we've shown that possible that the one we're in is perhaps a little bit more energetic than the previous ones, because the Atlantic is misbehaving, basically. Um, and tides are absolutely crucial for the uh, system and for evolution events and for sustaining climate and dealing with things that are being dumped into it. And the present day tides are not a good representation of tides of the past or of the future, uh, for that matter. Uh, the kind of two take home messages. And then I'm always asked afterwards that what, how accurate are those past reconstruction? How accurate are Kara's animation? And I'd like to show you a picture. Is this. And if you look at it, you can make out the shape of present day Earth in it. That's North America. It's South America is Africa, Antarctica, part of Australia, uh, Scandinavia, part of Russia, Siberia, India, and a few other bits. This is bedrock that is more than a billion years old. Everything else we see in terms of continents have been made since then. And when rock forms, this type of rock, when magma, lava flows out, it settles, it can be dated, we know how old it is. And also there are iron in it, and they set, the iron settle according to the Earth's magnetic field. So we basically get a compass. And that means we know which latitude it was forming on. And then it's a matter of building a jigsaw puzzle from today going back through time. And there's a lot more information informing these reconstructions than I thought if you'd asked me two years ago. Uh, I was have those three points and the rest is guesswork. There's a lot more information in it th uh, than you think. And like I said, it took Cara four years to make that animation. And she started about 200 million. So she worked back 200 million years. That's a four year project basically to constrain everything, to get it going. So uh, that's uh, that. And if we, we can then add the other continents to it, and you see where these cratons, they are called, where they sit. Now, in talking about continents and continental formation, did you know that you can rearrange Earth's continents to look like a chicken? I promised a chicken, and there it is. And I showed this to the group in Lisbon, and they looked at it, and Joao, who's a tectonic expert, looked at it, well, it's not that far off geologically. It'd be hard to explain what Australia is doing up there, and Greenland should not be there, and it must have been a blooming hard Brexit because the British Isles have actually been sheared off and dumped <laughs> down in the foot down at that end. Uh, and then Joao, being Joao, said, well, what were the tides doing if this was Earth? And I couldn't resist it, so that's what the tides would look like. <laughs> on Chicken World, as it is known. And it's a quite interesting time slice. I might have to look a bit more on that, mainly because we can. And then I show this to colleagues who work, who are astronomers, who work with exoplanets, so plan, planets orbiting other, other stars. 
And they said, well, it's another random configuration, isn't it? Are there any more we could look at? And this is where fire breathing T-Rex comes in. So that's, that is very unlikely to happen geologically because there, you had to split Africa and things for it and stretch things a bit. It, it, that one is more probable than that one. But that's the fire breathing T-Rex world. And there are polar bears and horses and rats and rabbits and all other kinds. WWF have quite a few of them actually. We can rearrange, play, play around and rearrange Earth if you want to. And I'm going to finish with my favorite picture. It's taken by Cassini and it's Saturn and it's rings backlit by the sun. I think it's an absolutely beautiful image. And the reason I show it is because that is Earth. And that little speck there is the moon. And it puts the whole tidal thing in perspective a little bit, I think. And on that, I'm going to finish.